Hi, I'm David Lennonhawk, and this is Dave's Film Faves. I'll, uh, I'll work on the title card and getting a theme song. Anyway, if you didn't watch the introductory video of this new series I'm doing, I'm going to be uh, reviewing, or at least giving a little bit of a overview of some of my favorite films, but not just the favorite films that everyone might know of, but ones that I feel are not given the proper attention, or have been forgotten, or are otherwise unsung. So, for the first one I'm doing of these, so we'll see how this goes, now I want to tweak the format, I've decided to go with Exotica. Released in 1995 in the U.S., but released in 1994 at the Cannes Film Festival, and written and directed by Adam Agoyan. Now, the first thing you're going to notice from this case, you're going to be like, Hey, Dave, this really looks like softcore porn. Are you sure this is a real movie? Yes, I'm sure it's a real movie. But you have to remember, back in 1995, we had Showgirls coming out. In 1996, we had strip tees. So movies about strippers or strip clubs were kind of uh, de rigueur at that point. So, uh, when they came time for the DVD release of this, Miramax and the fucking Weinstein brothers decided that they would make the cover of this movie look like titillating softcore porn. Trust me, it is not that. It's not even close to that. It is actually an excellent, excellent, dramatic Canadian movie. Uh, usually when people ask me what my favorite movies are, just general favorite movies, I list them a top five, and I usually put Exotica at number three. My history with Exotica, it used to air on Bravo all the time, back when Bravo was an independent film channel and an arts channel, and not a channel devoted solely to reality shows aimed at gay men. Uh, so at the time I had seen edited versions of the movie, and not actually a lot has to be edited out of it, even though it does take place around a strip club. And then uh, when I got to uh, my when I was doing my undergraduate uh, at college, getting my film studies degree, I actually took a class where half of the semester was devoted to Adam Agoyan. The other half was devoted to the Coen Brothers, who I ended up discovering that I didn't like a lot of their stuff, even though I really love uh, Fargo and Big Lebowski. But uh, because of the half of the semester that was de de dedicated to Adam Agoyan, I got to look at some of his earlier work that I hadn't seen, and also some of his later work. And um, I like most of his stuff, though his, his recent stuff is not as good, and some of his older stuff really suffers from just kind of being experimental, like student filmmaking type stuff. Uh, movies like Speaking Parts I really like, but there's some other ones that are early and not so good. But Exotica and uh, another film that I'll probably end up reviewing another time, so I won't say which one it is, uh, represent the height of Agoyan's best. So what's the movie about? Well, Exotica takes place in uh, Canada, I believe Toronto, but I'm not 100% sure on the location there. And it's told in a non-linear format, so it kind of jumps a little bit around in time, though it is mostly uh, chronological, though it does have a lot of those flashbacks. And we basically follow a large group of very sad, depressed people whose lives uh, sort of either revolve around or eventually intersect uh, at a strip club uh, called Exotica. Uh, one of our main characters uh, we meet is Francis, who's played by Bruce Greenwood. Uh, Francis uh, seems very sad and depressed throughout the movie, but we don't learn until much later why. And Francis has a little bit of an unhealthy ritual. Uh, Francis um, is a kind of sort of estranged from his brother, uh, but he still sees his brother because on many nights he gets his young niece, played by a very young Sarah Polly, to go over and uh, they say babysit, but Francis doesn't appear to have any children, uh, so it's more like house-sitting. And so the niece, whose name is Tracy, ends up just going there and practicing her uh, musical instrument. Uh, and while she does this, Francis ends up going down to the Exotica. And we're, we learn that he goes always to the same table, and he waits for his favorite dancer, a girl named Christina, uh, played by Mia Kirshner, who would later go on to do things like the L word and stuff like that. Uh, who, and she usually has this uh, schoolgirl outfit dancing routine. And uh, he waits for her to be done so that she can give him a private dance at one of the, the tables upstairs. And then later he retreats to the restroom. Um... Uh, Christina's dance is to Leonard Cohen's Everybody Knows, and that song um, plays throughout the film, and it sort of ties into uh, sort of the general malaise and the basic themes of the film. Uh, it's also a song that I have heard for the first time during this movie and I ended up loving it. It's Since then, it's been used in uh, a number of other movies. The last one I heard was during the closing credits of War Dogs, which is nowhere near as good as Exotica, but it's an okay film. So... 
uh, why Francis keeps going to this strip club, because he's not getting any sort of normal uh, purient interest from it. He's not the normal uh, sleazebag who would go to these type of places. And Christina sort of dances for him, and she also sits and talks with him, and it's kind of clear that they have some sort of relationship, and not romantic relationship, but some sort of connection outside of the strip club uh, from prior. Um, but she seems to sort of need the connection and also sort of pity Francis. Um, who, someone who doesn't take kindly to this is the DJ of the club. His name is Eric, and he's played by uh, Elias Cotiaz. Uh, it seems he is the ex-boyfriend of Christina, and he's currently dating uh, Zoe, who owns Exotica. And uh, Zoe is currently pregnant, so he's basically the boyfriend of the current owner of the club and the ex-boyfriend of Christina. And he seems to be jealous of the connection that Francis and Christina have. Uh, meanwhile, uh, just after all of that, we're also introduced uh, to a man uh, named Thomas, who's um, played by Don McKellar. He has a uh, pet shop, and we learn that he is making thousands of dollars on the side smuggling exotic bird eggs and other like rare exotic animals that are um, banned, or um, they would otherwise be um, illegal or have a heavy fine for. Uh, Francis, uh, we find out, works for Canada's version of the IRS, like, I'm not sure what they're called, the Revenue Department or something, and he's actually auditing uh, Thomas. And through a, a basic series of events where Francis goes through the books and finds out what's going on with Thomas, he ends up uh, making Thomas go into the exotic club to find out some information from him after Eric uh, schemes to get Francis to be banned from Exotica. Just going over those basic plot elements, you might be wondering what is special about this movie. And unfortunately, it's very hard for me to explain what is great about this movie without going heavily into spoiler territory, because this film unfolds very uh, slowly, and it peels apart different layers of mystery. Mostly we just know that these characters are sad, but it's only as the film goes on that we realize what the connection is between these characters, what... Um, what histories they have in their past, what tragedies they've suffered, and things like that. But one of the main things that comes across in this movie is that the characters are all dealing with their negative emotions, mostly grief or sadness or regret um, about their life, in very unhealthy ways, particularly unhealthy ritualistic ways, that they, in order to cope with whatever pain they're dealing with, they fall into these certain patterns and these rituals that they keep going through, and these patterns are not healthy for them, uh, and yet it's the only way that they have to deal with the enormity of pain that they're feeling inside. And so what we have is a very beautiful, sad, depressing movie that seems to buck the expectations when you tell people it's a movie about a strip club. And the characters are just really interesting, and when you find out what actually happened to them, what, you know, how these characters are actually connected, it's really heartbreaking, because it's sort of like a movie where we begin at the third act, and we don't know what's going on, so we don't know what the emotional weight is. We just see kind of people who are like, why, what is going on here? Why are they so seemingly up, just have the weight of the world crushing them? And why are they sometimes behaving in weird manners? Like, why does Francis have his niece babysit his empty house and things like that? And as we learn what goes on, we end up sympathizing and empathizing with these characters and really feeling for them. And what sort of helps with this is, I mean, you have this very moody, interesting score with it, and then the Everybody Knows, which keeps coming in as a recurring uh, motif for sort of tying together uh, the film. And it's just a, a beautiful movie about characters and about emotion and about just crippling sadness. I mean, this is a very depressing movie, and but not depressing in a tearjerker, like, you know, weepy movie, like a, it's not a Beaches or a Steel Magnolias or some bullshit like that. It's sad in a way that really, like, caves in your chest. And, you know, the, the very last shot of the film, it doesn't, it's not very explicit as to what's going on, but you get what's going on and it holds there for a very long time while the score plays. And the last scene of the movie, the last shot of the film, is chronologically the earliest part of the movie. So it's only in that last thing that you realize the full, 
the full mesh of how some connect characters end up together. And you sort of realize the true depths of pain and tragedy that are tying these people together. And even though they have no healthy way of dealing with this pain, you understand, even though you wish they could break out of these patterns, why they've gotten into these patterns. Um, the film got pretty great reviews when it first came out. It's not a movie that was sort of ignored and then didn't get its audience till later. At the time, I mean, it was at the Cannes Film Festival. Uh, it got massively good reviews when it came out. Its box office did about what you'd expect an independent film from Canada to do. Uh, weirdly enough, um, the Adult Video News Awards, you know, the porn awards, they actually gave it an award for, like, some, I forget the title of it, but it was like most erotic non-pornographic film or something, which is odd, because I wouldn't describe the film as sexy or arousing in, in any way. In fact, there's there's some nudity in the film, but it's brief and darkly lit, and it's it's not really there as much. It's not showgirls or even striptease for that matter. It's, it's not a, a titillating film. If anybody picked up the movie looking for, like, spank bag material based on this cover, you're not getting it. I mean, unfortunately, yeah, this is this came out when DVDs first came out, this release, by the way. It's just a bare bones. It doesn't even have a trailer on it. Uh, there was a special edition Blu-ray that was released only in Canada. Uh, eventually, because you have to import it, they don't sell it in American stores, even though it's it's Region A, so you can play it on American uh, or United Stadiums, I guess, because Canada's part of North America. You can play it on U.S. like uh, Blu-ray machines. Uh, so there's no regional encoding issue, you just have to import it. So I might get that at some time, supposedly there's an audio commentary and some good stuff on there, and the cover is more uh, indicative of the film's content than this piece of shit. I mean, I remember when we actually watched this movie in uh, my Adam Agoyan class, uh, they actually commented, the professor had commented on how horrible this cover is, with like the eyes and, what's the tagline? Uh, in a world of temptation, obsession is the deadliest desire. I mean, there is obsession, not so much temptation, but there is sort of obsession and um, the inability to leave things behind, which is sort of the main, if there's a main thing about this movie that separates it from anything else I've seen, it is just the depths to, that, to what sad people will do to avoid dealing with their emotions and dealing with their tragedy, the way that they sort of bind themselves in a straitjacket of familiarity and, and certain behaviors and rituals in order to be able to just get on through life. I mean, one of my favorite uh, parts of the film, uh, Francis is driving his niece home. Um, and uh, the niece has been questioning him, like, why do you... Why do you um, get me all these nights to, to babysit your house when there's no baby? And before he's about to drop her off, he parks in um, like the driveway or the parking lot of where they live. I think they, I think um, his niece and his brother live in maybe a, a motel or a pretty cheap apartment. Um, and Francis, almost more to himself than to his niece, just says, "Nobody, er, nobody asks you to be born, and yet one day here you are." So now that you're here, who's asking you to stay? And I remember when I first saw that scene, and I must have been maybe 13 or 14 the first time I saw this movie, um, that line just struck me as the most sorrowful and painful line of dialogue to hear, especially the way that Bruce Greenwood delivers it. I mean, all of the actors in this film are phenomenal, but Bruce Greenwood is amazing. And if, if any of the characters can be said to be the main character, it's probably Francis, even though this is really an ensemble. I mean, you even got, as Francis's brother, you have Victor Garber, who would later go on to Alias and some other stuff, and he's a paraplegic. Um, so he's stuck in a wheelchair and everything. And he has a, a very small uh, role in the film, but all of the actors in here, um, Elias Kodiaz, uh, Don McClellar, who is, you know, pretty big in uh, Canadian films and stuff. I always used to confuse Don and Elias in other movies. They don't quite look similar, but their faces have the same basic structure, so I sometimes confuse them. Like, which one was Casey Jones in the movie? But <laughs> yeah, because he's in, um, was it Ninja Trolls 3? I forget. Not one of my favorites, so it's not going to be in this, uh, this video series. But, um... I guess it's as far as a movie where if I want to watch it and just feel emotion, you know, I guess the way that some people might watch Beaches or might watch like their favorite sad movie, the way that some women might watch a weepy like The Notebook, uh, Exotica is that film for me. I just find it 
as far as, like, feeling something. Because, I mean, there are movies that can stimulate the intellect, or they can make you laugh, or uh, they might be visually beautiful, but a lot of the movies that really, truly affect me, like, top ten movies in my life, those are the ones that are f that hit you like a gut punch to the heart and really have a strong emotional uh, feeling that they make in you. And Exotica might be the most emotional film that I've ever seen as far as making me feel something. And it's just a wonderful, excellent movie. And like I said, it's probably my third favorite film of all time if I were ranking all of them. And it's the first video in the series. So if you're interested in Exotica, I don't know where you can stream it. There is that uh, Canadian Blu-ray that is available. I think there's a, a DVD available in England and maybe Germany as well. Um, this thing, which is bare bones, is out of print. It's, it, I mean, you can buy, you can spend an arm and a leg for it. I think it's like 30-something bucks on Amazon, previously viewed. So it's not the most readily available on the home video market as far as I know, but it is a film that is very much worth uh, seeking out. And, uh, and especially the score is amazing if you can find a copy of the soundtrack. And of course, Leonard Cohen's Everybody Knows. You can just listen to that. everyone's upload of that song on uh, YouTube. I think Exotico, more than anything, has made that look one of Leonard Cohen's most famous songs. It's like that and then Hallelujah, I guess. But So, that's Exotica, 1995. Uh, definitely go rent that. And uh, I'll figure out what the format is for future videos, and I have to decide on the next uh, movie I'm going to choose for this. So until then, uh, hope you got a movie recommendation that uh, maybe you can uh, go watch now. I'll see you later.